hello everyone. I, you know, I've been watching as, as the chat has been going on, people saying where they're from, and you know, all of you from warm places. Um, <laughs> How awful! I mean, it's it's below freezing here in Paris, and uh, and I'm seeing people from Australia and Marbella, Spain, and Honolulu, and all these nice warm places. And uh, how dare you? Anyway, I hope I hope that you are having a lovely time wherever you are, and that you're enjoying it. So uh, today, I'm going to try to help you take control of iCloud. Um, what I'm going to do is give you a mm, fairly brief presentation on uh, what iCloud is, what some of the main features are, how you set it up, and then I'm going to talk about some of the problems, configuration issues, uh, aggravations that some people have encountered with iCloud and some ways to get around them. I, I, I certainly will not cover everything that, uh, that might have gone wrong for you or every question you may have. So I encourage you, if you have anything that I haven't addressed during the presentation itself, to ask a question in the chat. And then after I'm done talking, I'll, uh, I'll answer as many of those questions as I possibly can. So here we go. Um, what is iCloud? Well, um, first of all, let me tell you what it's not. Uh, it isn't software. Uh, that is to say, you can't go buy an iCloud DVD or you can't download iCloud. Now, of course, there is, I, there is software built into Mac OS X that uh, has to do with iCloud, and you can download software for Windows, and there is software that's part of iOS that is part of iCloud, but it's not, it's not a piece of software. It's also not a website, I and mean, there is a, an iCloud website, and you, you may want to use it for any number of, of things like checking your email or, or uh, adjusting your calendar uh, entries when you're not using one of your you know, Mac or PC or iOS devices that has the iCloud uh, stuff on it, but it's not, uh, it's not fundamentally a website. The way Apple wants you to think of iCloud is it's a web-based or, or let's just say internet-based service for keeping all of your stuff the same on all of your devices. So you have, whether you have a Mac, a PC, an iPhone, an iPad, an iPod Touch, or any combination of the above, the idea of iCloud is that you create or download or buy some piece of data on one of those devices, and then that gets sent up to the cloud, and it gets sent down to all of your other devices. So this is a very different model from what Apple uh, previously did with MobileMe and, and iTools and .Mac. It is, uh, it, it's, it's supposed to be invisible. When it's working correctly, uh, iCloud shouldn't be a thing that you even look at at all. It's just the service that sort of works in the background and makes all of your data the same in all these different places. So I'm going to talk about exactly what that means and, and how it succeeds and fails in, in a bit. So uh, to, 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 to sort of explain why iCloud is cool or what sorts of problems it's trying to solve, let's review the old way of thinking. And by old, I mean like two, three years ago, back in the ancient uh, past. So back in the bad old days, uh, it used to be the case that if you have a PDA or a telephone or some other gadget, uh, it would have a copy of all your stuff, your calendars, your contacts, your, uh, you know, uh, your documents, any, anything you want to carry with you. Your Mac or your PC would also have a copy of all that kind of stuff. And uh, every once in a while, you will connect up a USB cable and you will click a button and hope for the best. If everything is going really, really well, then at the end of this sync process, your, your portable device and your Mac or your PC will have all exactly the same data. Uh, and if, if all doesn't go well, you might have conflicts or uh, warnings come up, you know, which, which one of these contacts is the right one, which one should I choose? And if things go really, really badly, you might not get any warnings but still find that your data is out of sync. Well, with MobileMe, and remember this is a few years ago, uh, Apple introduced push updates. And so Apple was starting down the path of trying to get rid of syncing as a separate activity that you have to do. So the way push updates worked was, was very simple. You, you uh, enter or modify your data on any device, your Mac or your iPhone or whatever. And immediately when you do that, that one little atomic piece of data is pushed up to the cloud. Not all of your contacts or all of your calendars, but just that one thing that you entered or, or changed. And as soon as the cloud has it, uh, it pushes that data back down to all of your other devices. Now, in MobileMe, this worked for only four kinds of data, your mail, contacts, calendars, and bookmarks, that is Safari bookmarks. With iCloud, uh, Apple has taken those four types of, of data 
and added push updates to a few more. So now you can also do push updates with photos and with documents, for example, pages or keynote or numbers, and with music, TV shows, uh, if, if and only if you're in the United States, sorry, uh, apps and books. So uh, Apple has taken what was working pretty well in MobileMe and made it even better and added to it a bunch of other kinds of data that can sync most of the time uh, without, having, without you having to do anything. You just simply create or modify the data and boom, there it is. So uh, can you use iCloud? This may not be as obvious of, uh, of a question as it sounds. First of all, if you have a Mac, you have to be running at least Mac OS 10 10.7.2. So uh, just yesterday, I guess it was, 10.7.3 came out, or two days ago. Um, so uh, if you're running the latest version or the previous version of Lion, uh, then you can use iCloud. If not, then you'll have to upgrade your Mac. And if your Mac can't be upgraded, uh, that's a little problem we'll talk about in a bit. If you have a PC, it has to be running Windows 7 or Windows Vista. Uh, that is to say, XP users are not invited, sorry to say. Uh, now, even though Windows 7 and Windows Vista can use many features of iCloud, uh, you can't use absolutely every feature of iCloud. Uh, as you might expect, Apple uh, does give preferential treatment to Macs. If you have an iOS device, it has to be running iOS 5 or higher. That means that people with older iOS devices, that is, you know, earlier, uh, like the first uh, two generations of iPhone, the first three or four generations of iPod Touch, uh, cannot use all of iCloud's features. And if you have an Apple TV, that is the second generation, uh, the small black one, that also has a couple of iCloud features. Now, of course, you don't have to have all of these devices, but you need to have at least uh, a Mac or a PC that meets these system requirements. And then if in addition you have any iOS devices or Apple TVs that uh, meet those requirements, uh, you're in. You will also need an Apple ID, which is just a username and password, but uh, it turns out to be a little more complicated than that, as I will talk about in a little bit. Now, if all of your devices meet those system requirements, that is, every, every Mac, PC, iOS device, whatever that you have in your, position, in, in your possession has the right software installed, then there is no reason not to jump into iCloud right now. It's free, it's easy to set up, and it will make your life better in a lot of different ways. However, if some of your devices do not meet the system requirements, you basically have three choices. One choice is don't use iCloud, which may sound silly, but it's actually not the end of the world. I mean, iCloud does some great things, but you know, 80% of iCloud features can be uh, had in some other way. You can get a lot of the same functionality with services from Google. You can get a lot of the same functionality with services from uh, an Exchange server. Um, not all of them, but a lot of them, and so if you can't use iCloud on one or all of your devices, that is an option. Second choice, and of course, what Apple would like you to do is to replace your outdated devices. Apple is in the business of selling hardware, so uh, Apple would be very happy if you bought the new thing uh, every time it comes out, and that is an option. And then the third option is to go without some services on older devices. Now, as I said earlier, you have to have at least a Mac running 10.7.2 or a Windows machine running Vista or Windows 7 in order to even get entrance to iCloud. Uh, once you've done that, uh, you can install, you can set up just certain iCloud features on older devices. Uh, including, you know, Macs running Snow Leopard and older iOS devices. You can't get all of those features on all the all, the, all of those other devices, but you can get some of them. All right, so that's the basics. Let's take a quick spin through some of the major iCloud features. Uh, first, I'm just going to spend 60 seconds breezing over stuff that's pretty much the same as it was in MobileMe. So if you ever used MobileMe, this will all be familiar to you, and really not a whole lot has to be said. And if you've never used MobileMe, uh, still, you, you should probably uh, uh, understand pretty much what this is all about. So uh, mail, which you can get on your iOS device or your Mac or your PC, and also on the web. Same thing with contacts and calendars. You can use a desktop application or you can use a web browser to get all this stuff. Uh, Safari bookmarks, 
Uh, now remember, this is only for Safari, not for other browsers. And the only thing that iCloud adds that we didn't have previously was support for reading list, which is a sort of, you know, save this article for, for me to read later. Um, then there is what I'm calling Find My Noun. So originally there was Find My iPhone, and then there was Find My iPod Touch, and Find My iPad, and then Find My Mac, and now we even have Find My Friends. So uh, I'd sort of collectively call all those Find Things and People, Find My Noun. So that works the same as it did under, uh, under Mobile Me, except that now you can find more things. Uh, the little catch is that you can, you can only find devices that are using an iCloud compatible operating system. So if you have an old Mac, let's say, that's still running a Snow Leopard, you can't find that even though uh, iCloud supports Find My Mac. And then the last thing is back to my Mac. Same thing. This is a, 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 a set of features that lets you, uh, you know, take a, let's say, a laptop to a cafe or a library, someplace remote, and then either see files, you know, share files, move things back and forth, or share your screen from your Mac back at home or at the office. Now, uh, back to my Mac is great. It worked in Mobile Me. It works in iCloud. But again, the same restriction applies which is that you can't get back to a Mac that is not running iCloud software. So as for the new stuff, first new thing is iCloud downloads. And uh, there, there's not a whole lot to see here in iTunes. You'll go into the Store Preference pane and uh, click uh, one or all three, any, you know, one or two or all three of these checkboxes, Music, Apps, and Books. Uh, when they're checked, when any one of those checkboxes is checked, what that means is that when you purchased, let's say, a, a book in the iBook store, that I, I purchase it on some other device, and as soon as Apple uh, you know, has, has a record that that purchase has been made, then this device, the one you're on right now, the one you're checking that box on, will immediately receive that. So uh, the way I use this is sometimes I'll be I'll be out somewhere and I will I will find uh, an album that I really want to have. So I will go into the iTunes store on my uh, iPhone. I'll buy the album and when I come back home because this the, the music checkbox is checked, that album has already downloaded to my iMac and it's there ready for me to play. So the same thing uh, is true with apps. You know, you buy an app on your iPad and it immediately appears on your iPhone and so forth. So all you have to do to turn it on is check those boxes on your Mac or PC in iTunes, and then on your iOS device, if you have one, same thing. It's a settings. In the store settings, you turn one, two, or all three of those switches on. The second feature is iTunes Match. Uh, now, this is optional. You don't have to have it. If you want it, you have to pay $25 a year. Uh, I think it is an extremely cool feature. So uh, all you do is you go into iTunes, you turn on iTunes Match, you enter your Apple ID and your password, and you agree to pay the $25 for at least one year. And uh, you turn it on, and uh, iTunes begins scanning your library. And it looks for songs that you have in your library that iTunes also has online. And when it finds one, it says, okay, uh, I've matched that. So I have, I have a record of that. And if it finds any songs that you have that aren't in its library, it goes ahead and uploads them. So at the end of this process, which may take minutes or days, depending on how much stuff you have, and especially how much stuff you have that Apple doesn't already have, uh, Apple servers will hold a complete copy of everything that's in your iTunes library. Once that happens, you can go into your iOS device or your other Mac or your other PC and turn on iTunes Match, and then all of those songs will also be available there. And so if you have you know, a, a small iPod Touch or, or iPhone that has, let's say, 8 gigabytes of memory, and you have 20, 50 gigabytes of music in your iTunes library like I do, uh, simply by turning on iTunes Match, you can see all of those songs on your other device, and then just download the ones you want. So you can tap uh, a name of a song to stream it live. You can also download things so that you can listen to them later. 
And there are some other great features about iTunes Match, such as the fact that if, if Apple has a version of the song that is of a higher quality than, than what you had, you know, maybe you ripped it off of a CD in uh, a low quality format and Apple has a higher quality format, then what you can download from iTunes Match is that higher quality format. It's completely DRM free and it's really neat. I, I use iTunes Match all the time. Um, in last week I was in San Francisco uh, speaking at Macworld and uh, we made our uh, usual pilgrimage to this uh, this store called Amoeba, which sells used uh, CDs and DVDs, and bought a whole bunch of CDs for like a dollar, two dollars each, and I, I popped them into my MacBook Pro. I, I ripped them all, and since iTunes Match was on, they were automatically immediately sent up to the cloud, and so when I got back to my Mac at home, they were already there, which I just think is, is incredibly cool. Uh, iCloud backup. Now, it used to be that when you wanted to back up your iPod or your iPad or your iPhone, you had to plug it into your Mac or PC with a USB cable and let it uh, back up to iTunes. And you can still do that if you want, but what iCloud backup lets you optionally do is back up to Apple servers. And what that means is that you can restore data uh, you can you know back up data even if you never if you never bother to connect your device to your computer and you can restore data as well uh, even if there's no computer involved so it, it's one of several features that helps your uh, helps your iOS device to remain untethered if you if you like it that way then there's PhotoStream so PhotoStream is keeping in the same sort of theme as the the app downloads and the book downloads and the music downloads. This is the same thing with, with photos. So when you go into iPhoto and you enable photo stream with these uh, three checkboxes here, what happens is you take a photo with your iPhone, for example, and immediately when you take it, it's sent up to the cloud, and then you can see that photo on your iMac or your uh, MacBook Pro or any other device you may have, another iOS device, without having to do anything. You don't have to actually sync or download or do anything else. The photo is just there. Uh, now, this is something I use all the time. I, I, I take a lot of pictures with my iPhone, and it used to be that I'd take a picture and then I'd want to see that picture later, but then, oh, right, I remember, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't synced that, so I got to you know, hook up my iPhone and go through the process of syncing it, wait for it to get there. It was kind of a real drag. Now I don't have to do that anymore. The photos I take are just there. But not only that, you take a photo with your digital camera, regular old digital camera, and you sync it with iTunes just, uh, you sync it, you know, with your Mac, with, with iPhoto, just as you normally would. And those photos, too, are added to your photo stream, and those will be available on, on your other devices, your iOS device. Now, uh, my digital camera has a, an iFi card. So any photos I take with my camera are already wirelessly automatically sent to my iMac. So what this means is that all of my devices now can participate in this. It doesn't matter whether I use my iPhone or whether I use my Sony digital camera to take a photo. All those photos are almost instantly uploaded and available to all my devices in, in PhotoStream. And uh, I think that's uh, incredibly useful. It's something I, I use all the time. The next feature is documents in the cloud. Now, the idea of documents in the cloud is, once again, taking the same principle, what we've done with calendars and contacts and music and, and apps and photos, and now we're going to apply this to documents. So the theory of documents in the cloud is that you use, let's say, Keynote here on an iPhone, which is what this, what's in the screenshot. And uh, you, you create a little presentation, and then later when you have your iPad in front of you, you want to continue working on the same presentation. So you open up Keynote on your iPad, and hey, your same presentation is there. You didn't have to save it. You didn't have to upload it. You didn't have to sync it. It was just there, because as soon as you make any changes on one device, it's automatically synced to the cloud and available to your other devices. So that's the theory of documents in the cloud. Uh, in practice, not so great, at least not yet. And the reason is that very few uh, apps have taken advantage of iCloud, and especially very, very few Mac apps. So I, have, I of course, have the Mac version of Keynote and Pages and Numbers, and uh, I, I would like that any, any documents I create on my iPhone would automatically appear in the Mac versions too, and vice versa, but they don't. If you want to get at one of 
those uh, presentations from your Mac on an iOS device, you have to, have to open a browser, log into the iCloud website, go to the iWork uh, page, and then drag in your document, and it'll upload it. And the same thing if you want to get a document that's on your iPhone, your iPad, into uh, one of your apps on the Mac, you have to go in there and download it. It's a real hassle, and you also uh, tend to lose stuff in the process of, of uploading or downloading. Uh, because the iOS version of iWork apps um, lacks some of the features of the desktop version. So we're all hoping that Apple addresses this in the near future, that there is going to be an update to the, to the Mac apps that fully supports documents in the cloud, and that other you know, third-party apps also add support for documents in the cloud. A few do. It, it's very slow, like PDF Pen. Uh, you can now use the desktop version of PDF Pen on a Mac and the iOS version, or sorry, the iPad version of PDF Pen and get at the same documents. But uh, unfortunately, this is, this is a feature that still feels kind of half-baked in general. So those are the basic features. And to, to set up iCloud, it's really, really simple. Uh, all you do under optimal circumstances is go into the iCloud preference pane or the iCloud control panel if you're using Windows. You enter your Apple ID and your password, click a button, and, and it starts setting things up for you. Once everything is installed and set up, you simply check all the boxes for the kinds of data you want to sync. And uh, in most cases, you will probably want to sync all those different kinds of data. You want to turn on Back to My Mac. You want to turn find, turn on Find My Mac or Find My iOS device. So you do that configuration on your Mac or PC, and you do a similar configuration on your iPhone, iPad. Most of the time, all you have to do is sign in and uh, turn on all those checkboxes. Now, there are a few other uh, changes you might want to make to your iCloud configuration that are a little bit harder to find. On an iOS device, if you go into the store settings, you'll see a little switch there that says use cellular data. And you'll find a similar switch uh, under iCloud settings and then in documents and data. So what these two switches do, and you can have them both on, both off, or one on the other off, is they make sure that uh, if, if it's turned off, that the automatic syncing only happens when you're connected over Wi-Fi. And the reason for this is that uh, a lot of us have uh, either you know, poor cellular uh, bandwidth, you know, poor connections, or we have bandwidth caps. So your, uh, your uh, cell carrier only lets you uh, send and receive a certain amount of data per month, and over that amount, either they charge you extra or they limit your speed or uh, they cut you off or, or do something other, uh, some, some other dastardly thing. So if you want to avoid having uh, your cellular connection used to upload and download uh, music and apps and books and so forth, uh, you can turn that off for each device here. Another thing you might want to adjust is what sort of data is backed up. So. Again, there's a setting on your iOS device. You can decide, you know, do I want my camera roll to be backed up to the cloud? Do I want data for each particular, each individual app to be backed up uh, to the cloud? You can turn that on and off. If there's something that, that produces a lot of data and, and you really don't think it's that important to have backups, uh, you, can, you can turn that off. Likewise, uh, you can manage your backups. So if you have lots and lots of data that has already been backed up for a certain app, uh, you can prune it. You can say, no, I, let's delete this backup or this other backup, or let's delete an entire backup for an entire device. You can do all that as well in this uh, iCloud configuration uh, setting. So earlier I mentioned your Apple ID. And in, in principle, your Apple ID is simply a username and a password, and the username is, is generally an email address. Uh, if you have ever bought anything from Apple, anything at the iTunes Store, anything from the Mac App Store, if you've ever made a reservation for the Genius Bar at an Apple retail store, uh, if you ever, ever had a .dot .Mac or Mobile Me account, uh, or, or done any of numerous other things, you you have at least one Apple ID. And uh, what Apple wants your Apple ID to be is universal set of credentials. With, with this username and password, you can access any of these Apple services, and Apple uh, knows that this is all you, and it keeps all your stuff together. 
If you were a member of MobileMe or before that a member of .Mac, then your so-and-so at me.com address or your so-and-so at mac.com address and its associated password counts as an Apple ID. Now, I put a little asterisk here because there's a little catch. And the catch is that if you were a member of .Mac back in the days when it was free, you know, and then you stopped paying for it at some point during the mobile me days when Apple was charging $99 a year for it, then you can still use the so-and-so at me.com address as an Apple ID, but you will no longer be able to use the mac.com address as an Apple ID. Um, I don't know why Apple has done it this way, but, but that, is, that is the way it is. Um, if you have a, you know, if you used uh, another email address, a Gmail address, a Hotmail address, or, or whatever as, uh, as your Apple ID, which is perfectly possible, and now you're uh, signing up for iCloud for the first time, well, one of the features of iCloud is you get a somebody at me.com address. But if you don't already have somebody at me.com or somebody at mac.com as your address, you're going to have to set one up. So. Uh, Let's just say you know, your, your email address is joe at gmail.com, and you sign up for iCloud, iCloud is going to tell you, well, yeah, unfortunately, joe at me.com is already taken, so you're going to have to, even though that joe at gmail.com address will be part of uh, your Apple ID, you're going to have to have another come up with a new address that is, that is available in the system to be used for iCloud. Um, now, what I just said was an example of the fact that an Apple ID can have multiple addresses. So your Apple ID may start with joe at gmail.com, and then when you sign up for iCloud, you have now added a second address to it, the you know, Joe Kissel at me.com or whatever it turns out to be. That's nice. That's useful. That's helpful, although uh, it can also cause some problems because uh, if you ever, if you, there may be some, some situations in which you want to actually split them up and have one Apple ID have one address and, and another Apple ID have another address, and it can be hard to, to find them to figure out what address is where when you uh, have more than one address associated with an Apple ID. Um, now, there is a place where you can go to manage your Apple ID, and I'm going to uh, send you a URL here. Um, now, what I just said was an example of the fact that an Apple ID can have multiple addresses. So your Apple ID may start with joe at gmail.com, and then when you sign up for iCloud, you have now added a second address to it, the you know, joe kissel at me.com or whatever it turns out to be. That's nice. That's useful. That's helpful, although uh, it can also cause some problems because uh, if you ever, if you, there may be some, some situations in which you want to actually split them up and have one Apple ID have one address and, and another Apple ID have another address, and it can be hard to, to find them to figure out what address is where when you uh, have more than one address associated with an Apple ID. Um, now, there is a place where you can go to manage your Apple ID, and I'm going to uh, send you a URL here, so hopefully that has shown up on your screen and is clickable. If you go here and enter your Apple ID, you can do things like changing your password. You can do things like changing the email address associated with your Apple ID and, and lots of other things. But one thing that unfortunately you can't do is merge Apple IDs, which I'll talk about uh, now. <laughs> oh, good. It happened to be the next bullet. Um, so here, here's the situation. Let's say that you, uh, you made some purchases from the iTunes store using Apple ID number one. And then some months passed, and uh, you started using the Mac App Store. And again, you know, Apple is asking for your credentials, but you either forgot that you made the previous purchases, or for whatever reason, you decided to use a different set of credentials. Now, there comes a moment when you have purchases from two different accounts, and now you want to get at both sets of purchases using iCloud, using things like the, you know, the automatic downloads and, and the re-downloading of things that you purchased before. You, you, You'd like to think that you could just merge those two accounts. Say, well, this is me, and this is also me, and I purchased stuff from either of these accounts, so just put them all together. Unfortunately, Apple has no way currently to merge Apple IDs, which is a real pain. Uh, several months ago, some customer got an email from, from Tim Cook in which he claimed that Apple was working on this problem. 
Now, exactly what working on means, I don't know, uh, but nothing has emerged publicly yet. So that is, that is a sore spot for, for a lot of people right now. Another thing that's a problem is sharing. So Apple has designed Apple IDs. In fact, really all of, all of their iOS devices, too, were designed to be used by one person. So um, on a Mac, you can have different user accounts, you know, sign in as me, sign in as my wife, sign in as my son, and everybody gets their own set of, of documents and preferences and so on. iOS devices aren't like that. iOS devices are designed to be used by one human being. And Apple IDs also are designed to be used by one human being. So if, let's say, for example, you have a certain Apple ID that everyone in your family has used for purchases, because this is the Apple ID that has your, your credit card number attached to it. Um, when, you, when you start working with iCloud, uh, it's going to be a problem, because you can't say, OK, uh, use the one Apple ID you know, you, you, basically, you can't you can't split up um, who has who has access to different things. So you can't say, uh, you know, Bob has access to uh, the contacts, but not to the calendars, and Jane has access to the email, but not to the contacts. Uh, basically. Uh, whoever is using an Apple ID has access to all the stuff that's associated with that. So there's no way to to get any any privacy. Now the one thing you can do, which is useful, is use one Apple ID for purchases and another for everything else. So for example, um, if everyone in your family uses a certain Apple ID, let's say Dad's uh, Apple ID, to buy stuff from the Apple Store and the Mac App Store, uh, you, there, there are a couple of different places on your Mac, on your PC, on your iOS devices where you can enter Apple IDs. In, in, in the place that is associated with purchases on each device, you enter that Apple ID. And then in the iCloud section, which is a different place, uh, you enter a different Apple ID. So let's say we have three people in the family. Every one of those uses the same Apple ID for purchases. But every one of them has their own individual Apple ID for contacts and calendars and bookmarks and everything else. That, that at least is possible, although it's, it's not as good as it could be. So I want to say a few things about migrating from MobileMe, if you haven't already done so. So if you're still using MobileMe and you're getting ready to, uh, to install the, uh, you know, to, to set up iCloud, Basically, on, on any Mac or PC, you can log in uh, to, you know, go to the iCloud preference pane and, you know, enter your credentials, and it will just walk you through the whole process. It does most of the things for you. But you need to be aware that certain features of MobileMe are going to disappear. And the very second you do that migration from MobileMe to iCloud, you're going to lose the following. You're going to lose Mac-to-Mac -Mac data syncing. So that means uh, in MobileMe, you could enter, uh, you know, go to the uh, MobileMe preference pane and uh, check the boxes for you know, keychains and mail preferences and system preferences and, and a bunch of different things. Do that on two or three or four Macs, and all of those Macs would have that same data synced to each other. That goes away with uh, iCloud, unfortunately. Another thing that goes away is pop access, uh, either for receiving email from iCloud with a pop client or from fetching, you know, using iCloud to fetch mail from another pop server. You used to be able to do that with uh, MobileMe. You can't do it with iCloud. Same thing with external addresses. You used to be able to tell MobileMe, uh, hey, um, let me send mail from, so that it looks like it came from my Gmail account or so that it looks like it came from my work account. Uh, and you, you can't do that anymore with iCloud. Um, another thing that's going away is address book on a Mac. You used to be able to publish your contacts so that uh, another person, say a family member, could get at them, uh, could subscribe to them. That is no longer part of iCloud. And as I said earlier, even though Back to My Mac works and Find My iPhone, Find My whatever works, you can't get back to older devices that are not using iCloud. In addition to those features, there are a few things that are going to be going away on June 30th. Gallery, iDisk, and Backup. So even, af even if you switched from MobileMe to iCloud today, you will still be able to get access to your iDisk and to all the other stuff that it's used for, but only until June 30th, then Apple is shutting it down and deleting your data, and you will no longer have to have a way to get at it. So 
if you have already switched to iCloud or if you are thinking of switching to iCloud and you have stuff in your gallery on your iDisk or in backup, uh, you need to come up with a replacement. So, for gallery, and gallery of course is just an online place to put your photos and movies. Uh, there are many, many services that let you share photos online, and, and a lot of them aren't as beautiful, as easy to use, as elegant as Gallery was. And in some cases, it's going to take a little bit of effort to move all your stuff from Gallery over to uh, one of these other places. Uh, but once you start using them, they're, they're really not bad. Uh, Dropbox you know, has, a, has a folder in your Dropbox that does pictures, and you just drag pictures in there to share them. Obviously, Flickr, Facebook, and, and all these others have ways of sharing photos that are okay, if not quite as elegant. Um, you can use your iDisk in several different ways. One of them is to get access to certain files yourself from different locations, and another, uh, another way is to share them with other people. So you want me to have some file, and you put it in your iDisk, then you send me a link to it. So again, that's going away. Uh, Dropbox, again, can be used for that purpose. Spider Oak, SugarSync, and again, lots of other services can replace this feature. But the key is set it up now. Get your data moved over now. Uh, whether you have already migrated to iCloud or not, uh, you don't want to wait until the last minute because your data could go away. Another uh, thing that your iDisk is used for is web publishing. So you could either use uh, iWeb to create a website or some other program and stick those files on your iDisk and hey, they're, they're available as a public website. Um, that too is going away because that's a usage of iDisk, that's something, or stuff that's stored on your iDisk. So really the only solution is to go and get an account with some third-party web host. There are thousands of them. Uh, just a few listed here like One and One and DreamHost. You, you, can, you can get a decent web hosting package for 5 or $10 a month. And in fact, uh, most of these services will let you do tons of things that Apple never let you do. They'll let you have uh, server-side scripting, they'll let you have PHP, they'll let you have Perl, they'll let you do um, all kinds of other stuff that uh, was never part of, uh, of MobileMe. So um, it is a little bit more effort. You'll have to get at your files through an FTP client or set up iWeb to use FTP instead of uh, just putting stuff in your iDisk. And if you're not already familiar with this sort of stuff, it, it can be a bit of a drag. But once the files are there, uh, it need not be any more complicated to work with than it was on, uh, on MobileMe. Um, I do want to mention one thing that, that has happened to a lot of people when they migrate from MobileMe to iCloud, and that is that duplicates appear. For example, in, in calendars, you know, you, you've, you've gone through the entire process, and now you're, let's say you're looking at the calendar web app on the iCloud website, and yes, all of my, uh, all of my appointments and, and, and calendar entries and to-do items are there. That's great. And then you look in iCloud, and you see two copies of everything. Um, this doesn't always happen, but it does occasionally happen, and so I wanted to give you a couple of tips for dealing with this. The same thing would go uh, for address book contacts or bookmarks. The first tip is if you haven't already uh, migrated, be sure to, uh, to back up first. And don't just back up. Also export. So go into, uh, you know, iCal or Safari or address book and actually export your stuff as a separate file. Uh, this is going to be very handy uh, for another thing I'm going to talk about in just a minute, but it just makes things easier. Uh, next, go into the On My Mac area. So Address Book and iCal uh, both have sort of two sections in them. There's the stuff that's in iCloud or in whatever server, and then there's the stuff that's local, it's On My Mac. What sometimes happens is that the two copies are ones, ones on the server and ones on my Mac. So sometimes uh, deleting all the duplicates is as simple as selecting the on my Mac item and deleting it, then everything that was stored locally goes away, but that's okay because you still have your copy of everything that's in the cloud. If that doesn't work, then you want to delete, you know, since you have exported all of your stuff already, it's safe, delete everything from, for example, iCal, and then import that file that you just exported and once you have deleted everything and imported, you should only have one copy of each piece of data. Now there's a, a sort of variation on this, which is, uh, 
and, and it, it's, it can happen with any kind of data, but it especially happens with bookmarks. And that is, you have three or four devices, and they are kind of syncing their bookmarks, but the bookmarks don't sync reliably. You'll get uh, some bookmarks will sync from one machine to another, but not to a third. Uh, some bookmarks don't sync at all, and that seems to be kind of random. So there is a procedure that I have, I have tried myself to, to fix this, and it basically goes like this. First of all, again, export your old bookmarks. So go into Safari, export all of your bookmarks. Uh, you do this from whichever, whichever machine has the best or most complete copy of your bookmarks. Second, once they're exported and they're safe, erase your bookmarks. You might have to erase your bookmarks separately on each device, on each Mac, on each iOS device, because the syncing doesn't necessarily work. But erase all of your bookmarks in every version of Safari. Then pick one device, doesn't matter which one, any one device, create one new bookmark. And in a couple of minutes, it should automatically sync across all your devices. So take a look, make sure it has synced correctly. If it has, great delete that one bookmark, and if it hasn't, you may need to you know, try again. Once uh, you've done that, again, on just one device, import your old bookmarks, and if one bookmark synced successfully among all your devices, then all of your bookmarks should as well. And once you have successfully synced all of your bookmarks that you were imported in one place, syncing should hopefully begin working everywhere. Uh, just one last thing I want to mention, and that is using iCloud with Snow Leopard. You have to have at least one Mac running Lion or a PC running Windows 7 or Vista to even set up iCloud. But having done that, you can get at certain iCloud features from a Mac running Snow Leopard. Uh, mail is almost no problem. Uh, I say almost because you have to enter different server addresses, which you can simply copy off of your Lion machine. It's not going to be an automatic setup like it was with MobileMe, but once you set it up, it's, it's just fine. Um, for calendars, uh, BusyCal, if you happen to use BusyCal, which is a great program, that works just fine with iCloud calendars and Snow Leopard. Um, or if you really, really, really want to use iCal on, on Snow Leopard, there is a procedure you can use to do that, and that is described in excruciating detail in this article. Um, now, contacts, I've read a bunch of articles on the web where people have these really complex procedures that, you know, you, you do this sort of fiddling in terminal and you do all these kind of magical things, and then your contacts might sync uh, with, you know, a dress book in Snow Leopard. But you also might get duplicates of all your contacts, or they might also disappear. And a lot of other things seem to be just very fragile. So um, there isn't really a great solution for that right now. And everything else, uh, find my Mac, find my iPhone, back to my Mac, and so on. Unfortunately, there just is no solution right now. So uh, that is my very, very quick spin through iCloud. I wrote this book, uh, and uh, if you would like to know more about iCloud, much more than I could uh, talk about in today's presentation, I would invite you to uh, grab a copy. And let's see here, I believe I can push out the URL for that. Two. There we go. And at this time, I would like to answer any questions you may have. So I'm going to uh, scoot over here to the oh goodness gracious to the Q and A tab. Hi, Joe. It's me as your host. Just checking in with you real quick. Yes, we received several good questions, and I wanted to thank our audience for sending all those questions. And just to let them know, there may be duplicates of the same question. So a lot of folks have the same questions. We've put them in the Q&A box for Joe. And we've also pushed out for all of you um, a discount code so you can get Joe's book today as a thank you for attending his webcast. So we'll turn it back oh, cool. to you, Joe, for Q&A. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go through as many questions as I can, and uh, I will probably have to give fairly brief answers, and I, and I hope that these are at least a little bit helpful. Um, so Joe Massey asks, are there issues syncing contacts with Gmail and iCloud? Yes, there, there are indeed issues. And, um, and basic, <laughs> what I'd like to say is it can't be done. Um, that's only approximately true. Um, Natively, you, you can't do this. So in other words, you can set up a address book on your Mac to sync contacts with 
iCloud and also to, uh, to talk to a Gmail account. And on your iPhone, you can also set up Gmail contacts and iCloud contacts, and they'll keep track of what account they were created in, and they will just continue to, to sync to wherever it was they were created. But merely doing that will not sort of cross-pollinate them. You, you can't uh, merge contacts between um, iCloud and Gmail simply by setting up multiple uh, accounts. They, they are really kept separate. Um, so one thing that you can do if you, if you want to use both, uh, there's a setting on your iPhone and, um, and you know, whatever iOS device um, for under, you know, settings, mail contacts, calendars. Uh, scroll down to uh, the default, uh, default contact list. The same thing goes for address book and, and uh, mail notes and so forth. Um, you, you want to choose when I create a new contact on my iPhone, does it go into Gmail, does it go into iCloud, or where does it go? Um, so you definitely want to want to decide where that default is. There is also an app you can get called, uh, looking it up right now, um, Contacts. If you want to merge local and server-based contacts, there is there is something called Contact Sync for Google Mail. For, sorry, for Google Email. This is from Playa Apps. It is an iOS. Uh, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a Mac app that costs five dollars. And let me give you the URL for that one second. Create new. Uh, this is called Contacts Sync. Okay, and there you go. Now I haven't tried this myself. I have only found that this is a this is an app that claims to be able to sync basically between Gmail and iCloud, so it's it's worth taking a look at. Um, so Liz Dorland asks, is there any problem with using both iCloud and the former iCloud that is now cloud.me? So basically, once once you migrate from MobileMe to iCloud, uh, that, that's it. You can't you can't go back. Now you could have a MobileMe account and a different iCloud account running on the same computer, and that will be okay up until June 30th when Apple kills MobileMe totally for good forever. Um, but uh, once once you have once you have made that switch, you cannot go back and and access a, a given account as both MobileMe and as iCloud. Um, so I'm, I'm not I'm not sure that's totally what you're asking, but uh, that's about as, as much as I know. Um, so Michael Snyder asks, are the three aliases associated with the .Mac mail account disappearing? If so, what can you do? So um, MobileMe actually gave you up to five aliases. So for example, my, my actual MobileMe uh, email address was jwk, my initials, at mac.com. Um, and, uh, and I realize a lot of people would, would probably like to just you know, send email to my name, uh, not, and not my initials, so I made an alias, Joe Kissel at Mac.com. So if you send mail Joe Kissel at Mac.com, that, that goes to my, my, you know, the same, very same account. And in fact, I set up a few aliases that way. So MobileMe let you have five aliases. iCloud only lets you have three. Now, if you had five aliases or four aliases with MobileMe and you, you switch over to iCloud, you can keep all five of those. But as soon as you delete one, you can never, uh, you know, never add that back. So the maximum you can ever have uh, with with iCloud is three, unless you have an old one that's, that's grandfathered in. So it's no problem to keep those same aliases. Um, it's only a problem if you decide you want to delete number five and then add a fifth one that you can't do. Um, Jean Ashmore asks: In June, mobile me goes away. Will .Mac or .me uh, email addresses stay or go away? They will stay. So. Both of those addresses, the uh, whoever at Mac.com, whoever at Me.com, those will continue to be uh, to be available even when uh, the rest of Mobile Me goes away. Um, Joe Massey asks, speaking of PDF Pen on iPad, how does it compare to Goodreader? Um, both support iCloud now. Um, <laughs> they have they have kind of different features. I 
I, I, I've used Goodreader since almost day one. It's great. I, I, I like it. It's extremely feature rich. It, it also has it has an unusual interface. Uh, it, it, it is some kind, sometimes kind of awkward to get at stuff in Goodreader. Uh, PDF Pen I've used on the Mac for a long, long time, and it has what I would consider to be a, a much more intuitive, much simpler interface. Um, I actually use both. I use Goodreader more for reading and, and transferring PDFs and, and other documents from one place to another. I use iPad more for annotations and you know, signing documents, those sorts of things on the iPad. I think it's probably a little bit better uh, than Goodreader for that. Um, uh, Ankit uh, Kapasi asks, can an app database on an iPhone be used across iOS devices via this service? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. I'm going to guess that you're talking about some third-party database app like, you know, FileMaker Go or something like that. Um, if that is what you're talking about, then, then the answer is um, probably not. If, if an app can be re-engineered so that it supports documents in the cloud, then maybe, but documents in the cloud is designed to work with documents like, you know, a word processor file or, or a picture. Um, it really wasn't designed to work with databases where little pieces of the data and not an entire file are changing at once. So I'm somewhat skeptical that that will ever happen really well, um, but, you know, my advice is talk to the developer of the particular app. Uh, Bob Rice says, I have a MacBook Pro running 10.6.8 and don't have any other devices. Is there an advantage in updating to uh, 10.7 in iCloud? Well, um, uh, advantage number one, you get to use iCloud. <laughs> Um, there, are, uh, there are lots of new features in Lion. I mean, there are like a couple of hundred new features in Lion, um, and you can find those listed on Apple's website. They may or may not be things that you care about, that you're interested in using. Um, you, you might even find some of them a, a step backwards. I really like Lion a lot. Um, it, I, I wasn't crazy about it at first. It's taken me some time to get used to it. Uh, but right now I really love it, and I would, I would feel... I'd feel unhappy to go back to Snow Leopard because I'd be missing a bunch of things. Your mileage may vary. Uh, I would say that iCloud, personally, I find iCloud valuable enough that that one thing is worth uh, having uh, Mac OS 10, 10.7, but, uh, but as I say, your, your mileage may vary. Uh, Daniel Vendatelli says, PhotoStream keeps the last 30 days of photos in sync. Does this mean I can't keep older photos on my devices or just that they will stay on the device but simply not sync to other devices? So what this means is that only the last 30 days of photos are, are kept in the cloud automatically. So, uh, you know, you, you, you snap a picture with your iPhone that goes up to the cloud. You keep on doing this, and, and uh, after a month, the older photos are going to start dropping off. Now, uh, assuming that you have at some point in those 30 days turned on iPhoto on your Mac, uh, they will have been imported to your Mac as well, you know, if, as long as you have everything, you know, the, those, those, all those checkboxes checked. So they will still be on your Mac, and then if you want to uh, get them back on your iOS device, then all you have to do is put them in uh, an album that is synced with your phone. So in, in iTunes, you go to the, you know, you select your device, you go to the Photos tab, you can select, you know, what, what kinds of stuff, which kinds of photos do I sync with my iOS device? Whether it's, you know, all photos from a certain date or all photos with a certain face in them or all photos from certain albums. And basically, as long as those, those photos that you've, that you've had automatically imported from PhotoStream into iPhoto are in one of those categories is automatically synced to your iPhone, they'll, they'll get back onto your iPhone even after uh, the 30 days are up. Okay, uh, Shirley Smith says, can videos made on an iPod Touch be synced through iCloud? Um, not currently, um, which is to, to <laughs> The photo stream feature that I described only works with photos, with still photos. It doesn't work with movies, which is a pity. Um, and I'm guessing that the reason has to do with just you know time and bandwidth because movies can be really, really big. Um, it could be that in the future Apple changes that. And um, it, it's also possible that apps like iMovie and Avid and other uh, you know, video editing apps on iOS 
will at some point gain uh, access to documents in the cloud so that they can be synced. Uh, but, but the problem, again, is that these files tend to be so large that it, it's, it's much harder to do this trick of just, you know, instantly updating. Uh, so much data has to be sent that you, you run a real risk of the sync not completing before you change locations or run on a bandwidth. So um, currently the answer is no. It, it could turn out to be yes in the future, but I'm not terribly optimistic. Um, Liz Dorland says, I had .mac slash .me starting in 2000. My photo collection is way too large to fit in iCloud. Uh, suggestions on how to manage. Uh, well, remember that the, the, the purpose of PhotoStream is not to keep all of your photos in the stream. Uh, the purpose of PhotoStream is to, to get photos from one place to another. So the purpose of PhotoStream is so that when I take a picture in one place, it then automatically goes to all the other places. Your Mac or your PC will always be the central repository for all your photos. I don't have all my photos on my iPhone or my iPad, I have tons more stuff in iPhoto than I have there, and, and iCloud doesn't change that at all. Now, as I was saying earlier, you, you still get to choose which photos, which portions of them uh, sync with your iPhone or iPod Touch or whatever in, in iTunes. Um, and, and so you shouldn't think of PhotoStream as being, uh, being all of your photos forever in the cloud. It's not like iTunes Match, which you can do with you know, your music library. It's really just a temporary thing to, to move photos quickly from one device to another. Uh, Laura Feeder uh, asks, uh, cannot delete PhotoStream pics individually, though? Uh, that's true. You can delete your entire PhotoStream if you want, but you can't uh, pick individual images from your photo stream and delete them. Now, I read a rumor, and this is only a rumor, I don't know this for sure, but I read a rumor that the feature to delete individual items out of your photo stream is coming in some future uh, software update. Uh, so uh, all I can say is, uh, which, I mean, uh, you know, and I, I, I would assume this is an iOS software update, although I'm not even sure it might be both a Mac and iOS uh, update. So I don't know anything more than that. I would just say I've heard that rumor. I hope it happens. That would be very nice. Um, Lynn Thompson says, I have two Apple IDs. Will iCloud work between the two? Um, I, I hope I kind of answered that before. You, you can't merge them and you, uh, you can use one Apple ID for purchases and another for uh, other stuff. Now, on, on, on an iOS device, you can set up multiple iCloud accounts. That is possible. Um, you can set up you know, one with one address and another with another address. It's just that certain features um, intrinsically will only work with one, uh, one account at a time, and you can't, you can't sync the two. You can't sync data between the two. It's, they're always going to remain separate. Uh, Karen Selinger or Selinger asks, I have an old Mac, but I have an iPad and an iPhone. Can I use iCloud between the iPad and the iPhone? Well, you can, but only if you can access somebody's newer Mac or PC um, for long enough to actually configure the iCloud account because uh, you, you literally, Apple will literally not let you set up iCloud, will not let you uh, migrate from MobileMe to iCloud or set up a new iCloud account unless you are running a new enough computer. Um, so if you can do that, even temporarily, then, then the answer is yes, but you do have that, um, that, that, uh, that one issue. Um, so Jean-Pierre uh, Vandenbroek says, just in case, hope you will cover the issue of bandwidth. I uploaded my 100-gig uh, music library, and suddenly the telephone operator blocked my Internet connection. It took me a while to find out what happened. So um, on an iOS device, uh, as I said, you can, you can block cellular connections. Um, but uh, if you're talking about, which I assume you are, um, iTunes on a Mac or PC, uh, <clears throat> Unfortunately, it's kind of all or nothing. Uh, you, you, when you turn on iTunes Match, everything goes up there. Uh, you can't just say only, only send these particular tunes unless you make a new iTunes library and only put the tunes you want to sync into that library. But having done that, uh, there, there's no finer grain level of control. That's, that's just it. Um, uh, so I, I recognize that there are, there are problems with band li bandwidth limitations, and for uploading, unfortunately, there's no control. You, you could choose to only download particular items on any, on any one device, but uploading them, you're, you're kind of stuck. 
Um, so I see one last question from Joe Massey. Are you going to talk about using iCloud together with Google Calendar? Um, and basically the story there is, is very similar to Google Contacts. Um, they're, they're separate worlds. So you can certainly set up a Google Calendar account uh, in iCal on a Mac or in BusyCal, and you can set it up on your iOS device and uh, alongside of your iCloud uh, calendars, and th those will continue to sync to their respective locations. That's no problem, but uh, they will not, they will not uh, intertwingle. They will not talk to each other. And I don't know of an app that's, that's comparable to the contact sync for, for uh, Google Gmail that I mentioned earlier that will, that will merge uh, calendars between those two systems. Um, it's, it's sort of a, a disaster waiting to happen, if you ask me. And uh, so unfortunately, those, uh, although you can use them side by side, uh, trying to combine them is, is most likely a lost cause. Um, so uh, those are my, my very quick answers to Sorry, I see, I see one more question there, really quick, uh, from Elsa. What about duplicated mail? Two versions of iCloud account appear on iPhone. Um, that may be, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that's probably a more complicated, <laughs> more complicated question than I can answer briefly. Um, if you have two copies of an iCloud account set up on, on your iPhone, um, my advice would be turn off one of them. You don't have to actually delete it, but just you know, go into settings, mail contacts, calendars, and turn off each of the features, you know, mail and, and, and contacts and calendars for one of those and see if that gives you what you're looking for. If so, if you have, if everything is still there with that one account, then you can simply go ahead and delete the account that everything else is turned off uh, from. Uh, if not, then, then uh, unfortunately that's a, that's a more complicated question that I probably can't uh, answer in 30 seconds, but, uh, but, but there you go. Um, if you have uh, more questions, uh, you may find them to be answered in my book, so of course I'd, I'd encourage you to look at that. And uh, I, I, I might have mentioned my email address at some point during this uh, discussion, so uh, if you're really desperate, you can, you can contact me that way. Oh, fantastic presentation today, Joe. Thank you so much. Folks, we hope you have benefited from today's presentation and that you have found it informative. We thank all of you for attending today's webcast. Joe, thank you so much again. Folks, we're going to try to see if we can get Joe maybe to do a couple more events for us. We, we know he has great books, and if you like what you heard today, please go to O'Reilly.com. You'll see his book right there on our web page, and we did put some codes in the group chat for you today, so you can get it at a really good price today, just today. Again, thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone. This will conclude the webcast. Goodbye, everybody.